Joanne, you have been respected for a very long time as a champion for disability rights. And uh, now you want to make sure that the history of disability rights is recorded. But tell me, who is Joanne McDonald? What's your history? That's an interesting question there. Who is Joanne McDonald? I was, um, my early years, let's go back to, I guess, my birth. I was, uh, that was my first involvement with the court system when I was an infant. Okay. I was actually born out of wedlock and my mom had neither the resources nor the capacity to take care of an infant born with a disability. So I ended up in the court system. I became what they call the ward of the court. And um, I spent the first seven years, I would say between hospitals, orphanages, foster homes and rehab. Don't really have a lot of information on my first seven years, but uh, yeah. I know I was busy going from one place to the other. I don't know if it was because of my, you know, uh, behavior, if I was difficult to get along with or... Uh, <laughs> or just a rascal. Or just a rascal, yeah. Yeah, so it was, um, yeah, being born with a disability, I think it just made that, it, that much more difficult for my mom to take care of me. So uh, I ended up in several foster homes before I found my forever foster home in St. Mary's at the age, almost seven years of age. And uh, I went with a family, John and Hilda St. Croix, and they, over the years, they actually had a number of 23 foster children that they took care of. They ended up adopting two, and uh, myself and my older brother were never put up for adoption. Um, but we stayed there for a very long time. My biological mom had put me in foster care, not up for adoption. So that meant I could not be adopted, even though my foster parents wanted to adopt me. I was not able to be adopted. I think it was the way of uh, my biological mom being able to check in from time to time to see what's happening with Joanne. That's, uh, that's my story. I like to believe that anyway. So yeah, it was, um, you know, years that I really had not a lot of recollection of, but uh, I think I landed in some really good places. I spent uh, a lot of time in hospital. But I also spent a lot of time in a place called the Sunshine Camp. Ah, the Sunshine Camp. The Sunshine Camp um, actually started in the 1930s, mid-1930s, and it was started by the St. John's Rotary Club. Yes. And at that time, it was started for disadvantaged children in the city. And they would have upwards of 30 children that would go to the camp during the summer, upwards of a two-week period. So it could be 30 boys for two weeks and 30 girls for two weeks. And they, basically, it was run by the Rotary Club, which, in fact, was run by or comprised of many businessmen within the city. So I guess they had the wherewithal and the knowledge and some resources to do this. So, uh, But they really gave children that were in really poor situations an opportunity to come and have really two good weeks of care and food and fun. The polio epidemic hit in the early 1950s, 1953, I believe it was the very first time of the polio epidemic. And that's when the Sunshine Camp reverted from providing uh, support to disadvantaged children to becoming a place of rehab for children who um, contracted polio. So it, at the beginning, it was only open for a six month period, but as the need grew, it was opened up for year round. So uh, that's where I spent a fair bit of my time in the early years, and uh, we had a lot of fun at the Sunshine Camp. I mean, it was a rehab, supposedly, but we had a lot of fun. We had uh, met many lifelong friends, of course, and uh, it was a busy, busy time there. We had a lot of people volunteering at the rehab or at Sunshine Camp, and um, we, had, we were on a ward. I would say there was probably about 24 of us on a ward. It, um, we made it a little bit challenging for the nurses and the staff to uh, keep up with us because we were, you know, a bit mischievous, one would say. But um, we also had some responsibilities as children in the camp. We uh, had a responsibility for making our bed and cleaning off the table after breakfast and, and meals. Mm -hmm. And we would oftentimes go into the kitchen and help wash dishes and those kinds of things. Nice. Is sneak a cooking maybe? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would say more than the cooking one time or another. But we had, uh, 
It was such an environment to be in. First off, uh, Sunshine Camp was located uh, close to St. Philip's. And the community at the time was very supportive of the camp. I think if there was ever a need, there was somebody living in that community who could provide and support, you know, either staff or the building or whatever. And we were located, the camp was located directly across from Sheriff's store. Oh, on Thorpe and Road. On Thorpe and Road, yeah. Yes. So I know that that store and the owners were often very supportive as to what was going on in the camp. If there was a need for food or volunteers, and I think that they, they certainly did uh, what they could to support that. But a funny story about the Sharp store. Um, the camp was surrounded by a fence. So the children were not permitted to go beyond that fence. They had to stay on the property. So Sheriff's store had lots of treats for children. The candy busy highway. Was, yes, a busy highway. But they had candies and they had bars and chips and sodas. So, you know, but as we weren't allowed to go, what we would do is we would go up to the fence and wait for someone to come along, typically another child. And we would call them over and ask them if they would go to the store and buy us a, a pop or a bag of chips, whatever. So we would give them our money. We were successful most of the times. We did get our, you know, our, our supplies, if you would say, but uh, there were many times where, you know, the children just took the money and, and oh. yeah, took care of their own needs, I'm sure. But uh, Mel Fitzgerald, I have to tell you this story, and everybody knows Mel Fitzgerald, right, certainly yes, in, yeah, in Newfoundland, yeah. Labrador. So Mel was at the camp with us at the, one particular time. Mel was not going to the fence. He says, no, I'm going to go over to the store. So of course we give him our money and we tell him what we want. And Mel's, you know, he's a very young boy also, and very tiny, so off he goes to the store. And he comes back with all the necessary supplies. And he's got, you know, sodas in his pockets, he's got stuff in his hands, he's, he's well laden down with, with, with goods. He gets in the middle of the road, doesn't his pants fall down, right down around his knees, right oh, down yeah. to the... Oh. So there, and it's like, okay, how do we get Mel back here, right? Because we can't go out and uh, anyway, we uh, we bring that story up to him from time to time now, just tease him a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But you know, the, in terms of the camp itself, I mean, there weren't too many things that we missed from from being at the camp. I mean, we uh, took part in lots of events that were going on in the city. We would go to um, church every Sunday. We went to church, we went to guides, scouts, uh, people come and visit. Um, so how about school? Did you get We went to school. school. We went to school. Uh, yeah, I remember our teacher was Mrs. Parsons. And now, you know, our school was very often interrupted by uh, clinics, uh, brace fittings, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, trips to St. John's for hospital visits. So, you know, we went to school. I'm not really sure what the learning was like, but we certainly mm -hmm. went to school. And then, of course, the camp made every effort to ensure that we were getting a good education. So you would come in from your hometown for whatever reason, treatment or visits to St. John's or whatever. Um, was there school at the children's hometowns and would that continue at the Sunshine Camp? Um, I know I went to school at home. Uh, at when, I, when I was in St. Mary's, I went to school okay. and, and back and forth. I would say a lot of the children, depending on the level of disability, uh, yes. were maybe not as fortunate because okay. accessibility would have been a real issue in terms of schools at that particular time. So yeah, um, but anybody who was admitted to the Sunshine Camp went to school. And when we talk about admitting, that's an interesting story here because, uh, you know, being in St. Mary's, you'd have to come into the Sunshine Camp every now and then for checkups, get your brace fixed or in for some physiotherapy. But just to come in for a clinic. So we'd come in for a clinic and, oh my, we're going to have to admit you. Well, you screeched and bawled because you did not want to be admitted. You wanted to be going home. So you kick up a, a fuss. And of course, it's so hard on the parents watching this, leaving their child behind and she's screeching her head off. Anyway, so you're admitted and you're there for maybe six months okay. and then you're going back home. Your parents would arrive to take it. You'd screech and bawl because you didn't want to go home. 
once again, very difficult. <laughs> but but having lots of fun. Right? Lots of fun, yeah. And like I said, I mean, the, um, the staff were tremendous, the community was tremendous, and we had a night watchman, and he was there every night, and uh, we would line up our shoes in, the, in a hall outside the ward, and that's what he would do at night. He would shine our shoes. And probably because you were going to? Going to church the next morning, so we'd have our shoes well shined. And I mean, the staff were amazing. They would uh, wash our clothes and iron them and mend them. And I remember somebody telling a story of uh, Mrs. Uh, Gertrude Crosby. She was a big supporter uh, of the Sunshine Camp. And yes, and she had a daughter with a disability. So apparently when her daughter would come in for clinic visits, Mrs. Crosby was known to sit in the hallway and mend clothes while she waited for her child to see a doctor. And, uh, so Mrs. Crosby was never going to miss a minute of providing support. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was a really good experience. I mean, like I said, we didn't miss too much. We had two huge playgrounds that we, uh, we would go to. Uh, I can actually remember one time uh, riding a horse. Someone with a very, I was very young, but I remember the sensation of being on a horse and the helmet and uh, just riding around the property. I mean, that's uh, that some interesting memories. But like I said, you didn't miss out too much. It is a lovely park, actually. It is. So would the children have it, get advantage of that too? We didn't. We had every advantage you could possibly think of. We that park was well used by the children at the camp, summer and winter, absolutely. And you know the uh, the Rotary Club. I mean, they have to be commended for the work that they did with the camp and and the ability to be able to transform it so quickly from you know a facility that basically operated just summer months to something that became year round because it wasn't it was just a summer camp. It wasn't even winterized. So yeah, they did a, a fair bit of work. So kudos to them for the work they did and the staff. I mean, I remember uh, uh, Marilyn Marsh, who was the administrator of the camp, and she was just she was tremendous. She had this knack of being able to work so well with children and being able to know children. And just another funny story, Bill Murphy, and I'll bring up his name later on in our conversation, but there was a young intern who had come to work at the Sunshine Camp. And she was very nervous. And Bill was mischievous and bad as they come, but hard to go. Anyway, he knew she was new and he knew she was nervous and he took advantage of it. So he'd say to his buddies, now let's give her a hard time. Let's make this day really, really difficult for her. And they did. And the next day she went to Mrs. Marsh and she said to Mrs. Marsh, said, I don't think she said I'm cut out for this. I really don't. Mrs. Marsh knew exactly what had happened. So she went to Bill and she said, Bill, she said, Juanita, she said, had a really, really rough day yesterday. I'm wondering, she said, if you would talk to everybody and see if they can make her day today a little easier. Maybe she'll be interested in staying here. Well, of course, off Bill went and, you know, Yes, okay, he could do that. Problem solved, right? So that was Marilyn. She she knew instinctively yeah. the children and what was going on. She knew how to handle them. She did indeed, yeah. She did a fabulous job handling them, yeah. Troy, you did have a lot of fun at the Sunshine Camp, and, and the kids had various issues and disabilities. You want to talk about your disability? I can certainly talk about my disability, and indeed, many of the children at Sunshine Camp had a variety of disabilities. When it started off originally, it was only polio, but then the need grew uh, for other children with varying disabilities with cerebral palsy, spina bifida, and spina bifida is what I was born with. And spina bifida essentially is just an improper formation of the spine, and it's a, uh, a what they call a neuro, neuro tube defect. So it left me with uh, some paralysis from the waist down, no sensation, and uh, bowel and bladder dysfunction. So that's basically the disability. Um, and it's interesting though, in my teens, approximately my teens, I was advised at that point, and I don't know when, but somebody said to me, when uh, people with spine bifida only live to 35 years of age. Oh. Yeah. And I think what it was, there was so little known about the disability at the time or about the condition. And it was seen to be a fairly severe disability in terms of the medical, how do we treat it? How do we do surgery? Uh, the surgery is very, um, very dangerous, I guess. And actually, uh, I was probably one of the few that had uh, my surgery delayed. I think I was, oh, I must have been seven for sure before I had my surgery, which was really late in, in the process. And uh, 
But like I said, I think there was just so many unknowns at that time. So, you know, somebody living 35, it's fine if it was seen to be. That, not, that person's doing pretty good. Still, sure, not so great to hear when you're in your teens. No, and you know it has an impact. I mean, you know, you're looking at your teen years, uh, who are you going to be when you grow up kind of thing, kind of education, what are your aspirations? And uh, so, you know, you did, things change a little bit when you know you got you know, so few years left and uh, that are ahead of you. So, uh, so I, um, when I reached 50 years of age, I decided, okay, I'm celebrating this. So I actually hosted my 50th birthday party. So I had, uh, I think, like 12 friends that came together and I hosted it. Everybody paid for everything. I said, this is just too much fun not to do that. So it was like kind of a, a thumbs up to getting there and uh, a bit of a, a nose up to folks who said you're not going to make it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Probably hung over the next morning, but it was a lot of fun getting there. How about other people with disabilities, uh, particularly spina bifida? Would you be one of you now if they were telling you in your teens? It's a great question. I think that uh, when I look at my friends around me right now that have disabilities, especially spina bifida, they're very over. I'm probably one of the oldest people living in our province right now that has spina bifida, I would think. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of younger people with spina bifida or younger than myself, but I don't know, actually, I don't know anybody older than me with spina bifida right now. That's not to say they're not there. No, just, I just don't know them yet. And not only did you reach 50 and beyond a little bit, you've done an awful lot. I mean, you went on and worked. Tell me about that. Yeah, I did. I've been, uh, it's, it's been a busy, busy period of time. I, I guess I was in the workforce for about I'm figuring about 42 years, so I was very, very fortunate to be able to do that, yeah. And I had the pleasure of working in a variety of sectors, uh, from community-based organizations to the private sector to the federal government. So it's been a, yeah, it was a really interesting, uh, little difficult, because I, I remember moving from community-based organizations, which I absolutely loved my, my job at the time, uh, prior to moving into the federal government with the Canadian Paraplegic Association. And I was with them for quite a few years and absolutely loved the jobs because I got to meet one-on-one -on -one with individuals with disabilities and do what I could to assist them to make it uh, get involved in uh, education and employment and talk about the barriers and how they can get through it and those kinds of things. So I really enjoyed that. But it was also, uh, at that time, I was fairly involved with advocacy as well. So that was... Uh, you know, that was a, another interesting role, if you will, to take on. So, yeah, so moving from community-based organizations into the federal government was, uh, it was so different, so different. I think for the first year, I did not want to be there. It was so regimented. Uh, paperwork was just unbelievable. I know I will call my friends and say, no, I don't think I'm going to last here. I really don't think. But I did. Of course I did. So which department was that? I was working in a department then that no longer exists. It was called the Department of Secretary of State. Okay. And it had um, programs uh, for visible minorities, Aboriginal people, women. And I went into this brand new program called the Disabled Persons Participation Program. And it's basically a grant-based program to support uh, consumers, individuals with disabilities, to come together and talk about their issues that they were experiencing and to strategize how those issues could be addressed and to hopefully put some resolution to them. It was a really fun program to work in because we could see the impacts within our department. We were seeing the impacts. We were seeing individuals coming together, lobbying for change, and in many cases being successful. Uh, you know, when I, some examples? Um, I guess the one that stands out for me would be the uh, what's called channel. Okay. And uh, basically individuals or consumers who were dealing with uh, mental health issues and uh, what we did is we funded them to come together as a group of individuals who've had experience and lived experience within the mental health system and were individuals with uh, varying degrees of mental illness yeah. and uh, really sometimes very difficult experiences that really shouldn't have happened. And they want to come together to see if we can't make some change to this. Like this should not continue what they're experiencing, whether it's stigma or whether it's discrimination to employment or lack of housing or whatever it is. So that's the one that kind of stands out for me. But we also uh, were able to fund a lot of uh, seminars and conferences and abilities for people to come together and explore the issues and strategize and brainstorm and lobby.
provincial government lobby federal government or lobby community in terms of creating chains so it was a really good program it didn't last as long as it needed to i think it started in 1986 approximately and it concluded the early 90s like 93 possibly so joanne tell me about advocacy i mean when did you first become involved my first venture into advocacy would have been my involvement with an organization called Wheelchair Sports Association through the Land of Labrador. And that would have been in the very early 70s. In 1972 was my first venture into wheelchair sports. Now, I had never been involved in sport before. So yes. this was a real uh, real eye-opener for me, just the very fact that somebody sitting in a wheelchair could go out and play basketball and compete in track. So, yes, I became very involved in wheelchair sports and uh, had a degree of success competing as an athlete and uh well, tell me about that uh, <laughs> you as an athlete yes we need to know <laughs> i competed as a uh, an athlete from 1972 to 1987 and uh, managed wow. to compete at uh, three, four Pan American Games and three Paralympics and several international uh, competitions. So I got to see the world. Probably would not have seen many places had I not been involved in sports. So I was very successful, very happy with that. But the interesting thing about wheelchair sports is that it really brought uh, people together who were obviously quite intrigued with the notion of sports because we didn't grow up playing sports. So we, um, we would gather at a, at a gymnasium in the center of the city. And, uh, but there were also other people who had disabilities who couldn't partake in sport. So individuals who had really severe disabilities who wouldn't play basketball, but, but could play a mean game of cribbage or checkers or chess. So what we would do is everybody would gather in the gymnasium. We'd play basketball and folks who were playing chess were off to one side. Of course, every now and then that basketball would end up on that, that crib board or that chess board or whatever. So, you know, people were not really pleased with us, but you know, what can we do? It's a, it's a basketball. So but we decided that, you know, this is really not going to work. So the people who were involved within the, um, within the organization, the board of directors, decided that there was uh, a need for another place for people to gather. They applied for funding and purchased the building on Mary Meeting Road and it became known as the hub. So wheelchair sports applied for funding, got money, purchased a building, and created an organization called the hub, the Physically Handicapped Service Center. And it and you just- you were in the center of all of that. Well, I don't, well, there were many of us in the center of all of it. I mean, I, don't, I can't take any credit for the establishment of the hub at all. I was very involved, but certainly not in the establishment mm -hmm. of it. But the organization that I was involved in was very much uh, an instigator in that. And the hub just blossomed. It just grew and grew. It brought people together uh, from everywhere. I mean, people that were typically at home, unable to go out because accessibility was a real issue when we were growing up. And uh, not a yeah, lot of places that go. About that. Well, in the 70s and 80s, I mean, there was no accessible transportation. None. None. There was no legislation co covering the accessibility of public buildings. Housing was a real issue. I mean, if you were looking for a, uh, an apartment to rent, finding an accessible apartment in the city of St. John's was not possible. None of the cabs were accessible. So people relied on family to get from point A to point Z. Um, so that was um, a real challenge. So people coming together in large forums like this was really unheard of. Mm -hmm. So um, it became a center of employment, of recreation, of resources, of people coming together to hold meetings, to share stories, funny stories, sad stories, people to learn skills around recreation, people become employed for the very first time in their lives because they'd not had an opportunity before. The hub had um, a massive resource library, so large and so successful that they had requests coming from places like Korea and Australia. They would mail resource material to anywhere in the world and they were getting the requests for those. They had a print shop that still goes today that hired at that time many individuals with disabilities. Um, 
they had they did start a transportation system at the hub at the beginning it was on a volunteer basis now volunteer basis is, is pretty challenging because you're looking at drivers with you know proper insurance and those kinds of things um, but when you start you know even that small transportation system people want to be able to go from home to the hub or home somewhere else so all of a sudden the demand just went up and up and up which you know uh, had to be met and the hub obviously was up to the challenge so there are conversations with city uh, of st john's and mount pearl in fact uh, did create a much more uh, larger transportation system so yeah so i mean and, and we had a uh, they had a repair shop for bikes and wheelchairs they had a trophy shop so they were encompassing so many things but even beyond all the businesses and employment that were was created they also became a um, i want to say a collection point for many other organizations in the city or in the, in, in the community who will come together for meetings to come to uh because it was accessible people could could come and have those meetings and and uh meet each other and, and share stories so it was well used by other organizations, not just organizations of individuals with disabilities, but many different organizations. It also became a very strong advocacy organization. It met with government, it talked to government in terms of what is needed, what needs to change to ensure that people have greater access to education, employment, accessible housing, and on. It did a lot of advocacy around it. To the point I think uh, uh, there was uh, an invitation received by the president or at the White House for the executive director of the hub to go and meet with the employment people to talk about what the hub was doing and how it was successful. So I'm saying to you that the hub, while it existed in St. John's, Newfoundland, had reaches right across this province or part of country, but also obviously well beyond the Canadian borders. So it was very successful. And it was a place of gathering. It wasn't just work. It was recreation. People came to dances. People played darts. People, it was so people oriented and uh, focused on creating change, but focused on having fun. And yeah, it was, it was an amazing place. So. The hub has done a great deal. The whole organization has done a great deal. And people have come together. But what is actually happening? I mean, are we, are we seeing better transportation? Are we getting legislation about housing and about architecture or what? Okay. We are seeing some change. Um, it, uh, it took a lot of work by not just the hub, but many other organizations in the, in the province as well, a lot of provincial organizations. So yeah, there, there was change. And, you know, from where I was involved, um, I did a lot of work around uh, attitudinal barriers because I saw attitudes uh, towards individuals with disabilities as very, very significant. Um, we dealt with a lot of attitudes, the judgments that people had on us. Uh, first off, there was very little expectations placed on any of us with disabilities because there was no expectation that you're really ever going to do anything with life. And I, I remember my mom, my foster mom, uh, when I graduated uh, from school, and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do when I was going to grow up. And uh, she said, no, Joanne, she said, you can come home with me and help take care of the foster children. So it wasn't an encouragement of, what, want to pursue university? Mm -hmm. What about going here? Really? It's like, come home, stay home, and take care of children. And that's just, I guess, one example of uh, a mom, of course, being protective. I'm going to take care of her. But on a broader scale, the attitudes, I think, were so pervasive and, and judgmental to us. And it, uh, it became really difficult sometimes for people to move forward because of those judgments and, and that sense of discrimination. I guess, you know, when I talk about attitudes, I'm going to give you an example of uh, just maybe a couple, just a fun one and another one. I was uh, competing in 1979 at the International Stoke Manville Games following year was a Paralympic year. So 1979 was a really important year for me to make sure I did well at that competition because I wanted to go into the next year, you know, well-trained and, um, and feeling very confident about that. And I had a very successful year at Stoke Manville Games, like very successful, broke a number of Canadian records. And one in particular was pretty significant. 
And I did a number of interviews uh, after my race. So t what was that one about, that significant one? The, uh, the Canadian record is just, I took off a lot more seconds of that particular race than oh. anybody else. So of course I was quite proud of that. And um, you know, my fellow athletes were coming and congratulating me. I did a number of interviews, the coaches were coming and patting me on the back. And anyway, this so uh, one woman came up to me and patted me on the head and said, I hope you get well soon. No, you know, I had just, I felt demonstrated that I really was very well very fit and uh, very eager to compete and uh, and successful at it but she stopped still saw a, a woman in a wheelchair yeah. so, so the, the the funny story is i did a lot of uh, speaking engagements across the province and in 1981 was the international year of persons with disabilities and so there was a lot of uh, publicity there was a lot of uh, requests to do speaking engagements so i ended up speaking at a number of schools across the island and in labrador so i'm in labrador this this one month and i'm um, speaking to a fairly large assembly i would say there's probably three or four grades pulled together in, in one one area and anyway i'm explaining about disability and i talk a little bit about my own disability in terms of what it means of wearing a brace now i don't have any sensation in my legs and just got it out of my mouth and the hand goes up the little boy in the back of the room says he just came out of a science class he said oh he says so does that mean he said if i take a piece of glass and i hold it in such a way and the sun goes down through the glass and it hits your leg that you won't feel it when it burns he said, you're absolutely right. I won't feel it. <laughs> what do you say? So it's, uh, yeah, th those are fun times. But I guess for me, uh, what I was trying to accomplish, trying to convince people that individuals with disabilities, if conditions were right, if there was access, if there was no discrimination, if we were able to work, then we needed to change what was preventing that from happening because we weren't able to do a lot of those things. And just basically talking about us as individuals and that we had hopes and dreams. The other one that was really particularly uh, important to me was language. We were, um, as individuals with disabilities, we weren't often uh, had nice names or labels thrown at us. Um, there was the, you know, people sadly with intellectual disabilities were often called retarded or feeble-minded. Um, people with mental health issues or mental illness. I mean, the names that were used to describe individuals with those particular disabilities was just unbelievable. Uh, people who were uh, deaf, I mean, it was deaf mute or deaf and dumb or, uh, you know, and um, crippled, handicapped. I mean, all of these names were used by other people to describe us. Some from medical based, some charity based, uh, some just very um, ugly. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to change how people, the names that people were using to describe us. So we chose to come up with names that described who we were. And it was so important to say that we are individuals with disabilities. We're not disabled people. We're persons with disabilities. We're people with disabilities. We're people first as people first, intellect, people with intellectual, intellectual disabilities will say, or people first. So I was trying to get rid of some of the uh, derogatory names that were used to describe any of us with disabilities and shift it, get away from the, uh, the negative part of those labels and move into a more people-focused uh, description of disability. So that was, I was pretty keen on that one for a long time. And the other issue, I guess, that consumed most of my uh, volunteer work was around accessibility. And even still today, I guess I dabble in that a little bit. I mean, we were at a time in 1972 where there was no legislation covering the construction of buildings. So new buildings were going up that were completely inaccessible. Health sciences complex, for example. I mean, you were looking at people in many cases who were using wheelchairs. No washrooms were wheelchair accessible. No washrooms. Uh, it's like, even today, it's unbelievable that they would even, who would even conceive of that. So accessibility became a huge, um, huge part of my life and um, worked on the Legislative Review Committee. Um, did, I, I think I spent something like three decades of going in every 10 years with pictures showing 
how this legislation is not working. It's like physically showing up a picture of an entrance to a building with a, uh, a windbreak separating the ramp to the front door. So there's a windbreak break right there. It's like, how, how does that get approved? How does that happen? How do you put stairs at the top of a ramp? Like, please explain that to me. It was happening. So sadly, what, what occurred, I would take the pictures and I would identify the building where it was located. So they would go and make that change, but nothing happened systemically to that legislation. It was still there. Yeah. So of course I did smarten up and I no longer provided that information to them. I just showed them clearly that the legislation was not working. So uh, yeah, and even still today, you know, it's, uh, it's legislation that uh, can be more of a barrier sometimes. When it was conceived, the legislation, the spirit of the legislation was to make our community accessible to anybody who had mobility issues or people who may have lost their sight or people who had hearing issues, um, even individuals who have uh, mental illness. I mean, it, it was meant to create an environment that anyone could use. We're well into 30 plus years with this legislation and we're still struggling. I don't understand. I don't understand how we can design a building, design a uh, street, design crosswalks that prevent people from getting in, from accessing them. And it's still happening today. I don't know what it will take to create that kind of change. It's frustrating. Um, I remember a, a friend of mine, Eric Norman, and Eric was just an amazing man. He's no longer with us now. Eric did such an, an amount of work around legislation and work at a national level. He was just simply an amazing man and gone well before his time. Uh, Eric and I would talk about the legislation. He said, Joanne, he said, you got to get out there. And he said, you got to monitor. He said, you got to go out and look at these buildings. And you got to talk to the owner. And you got to do this. And I'd say, Eric, there's legislation there. It needs to be enforced like anything else in this province. Any piece of legislation, government needs to take responsibility to ensure it's enforced. So we go back and forth on the back and forth. I think in the long run, Eric was probably right. We just need to be on top of this thing all the time. Mm -hmm. That's what I would, if he were here with us today, I would say you were absolutely right, Eric. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when we look at legislation on the accessibility, when it came out first, government did some um, PR with, um, with business owners, with contractors, whatever. So they have information sessions and they put the legislation on each chair and the regulations covering the act. And on the very top of that, they put an exemption form. So the very first thing the individual saw was the exemption form, how I can get an exemption. So I do not have to comply to the legislation. So, you know, it's mind boggling, absolutely. So the spirit was to create an environment that will be accessible for all. But the first thing the contractors, builders, business owners are seeing is like, okay, this is how you can be exempt from creating an accessible business, whatever it is. One example, uh, and this may not necessarily cover the legislation, but it's just an interesting story. Bill Murphy, a really good friend of mine, um, we would say to Bill every now and then, came out on Torbay Road, Bill, like we've been talking to them, we've sent them letters, and what they have created there is they have metal posts into concrete that completely covers their entryway. So what they're trying to do is prevent shoppers from leaving with shopping carts. But they've got one section that's wide enough for wheelchairs to go in, but they have a chain with a padlock. So in order to go into the store, you have to get somebody who's going in to let the employees know that there's somebody out there wanting to go into the store, or you would have to wait for an employee to come out. First off, of course, you have to find the key. Now you're out there in all kinds of weather. So it's just frustrating. So I mean, we give Bill a hard time. We chat and we'd say, what can we do, what can we do? Bill clearly had enough of our chatter one time. And he said, okay, I'll take care of this. He and his buddies get together. Now this is before security cameras and security guards and everything that we have today gets together with his buddies. Now you have to know Bill. I mean, he's a kind-hearted man, but he took no, no crap from anybody. He gets his buddies. 
Bill will proudly say to you, well, I'm from Monday Bond. We'll take care of this. Off they go in his vehicle. They go with chains. And they pull around like maybe four individual posts. And they attach it to the back of his vehicle. Posts are gone. Right? Hold up out of the asphalt. Never to be put back again. And as Bill would say, problem solved. So, I mean, that was pretty dramatic. It was very dramatic, but so much fun, Nadi. You can hear him bragging, I'm sure, till today. Talked about that, the excitement. and uh, Did it make the news? Oh, probably did. I had no recollection of that. I just remember Bill talking, telling us about the, the situation and how it was resolved and how it was handled. And, and that's Bill. Bill um, was a, a down-to-earth kind of guy and took uh, great pleasure in that's doing those story. kinds of things. Yeah. It's a great story, yeah. Joanna. The other one, I mean, going back to the uh, issues with the legislation mm -hmm. and how it was really falling down in terms of spirit and intent of legislation, in some of the um, drug stores, if they had a lift going up the second floor, you had to go up to the second floor to get the key so you could operate the lift. Those were the kinds of things that people were encountering on a daily basis. So, yeah, accessibility was a huge issue then, and it continues, sadly, to this day. Don't get me wrong, we have made tremendous progress. I mean, I, I need to say that we have made tremendous progress. Sad that we haven't made enough because the, uh, the attitudes or the mind shift hasn't changed either within government that's governing the legislation or within our community. So, but yes, we've, we've made tremendous progress. And do you think documenting the history of disability rights in Newfoundland and Labrador in itself might make a difference? I don't know if it will make a difference in terms of um, where we've been. I think where it may make a difference, Molly, is um, getting people to understand some of, the, um, some of the lived experiences that we had, some of the issues that we were dealing with, some of the barriers. I, I don't think that some people today may not necessarily understand that there was no transportation for people with disabilities in the early 70s. There was no apartments that were wheelchair accessible. There was uh, very little employment, housing, uh, it just didn't exist. Well, so in terms of recording that history, yes, I believe it to be incredibly important because we have had just absolutely tremendous leaders in this province that have not just done amazing work within our province, but even at a national level, we've been just, we've been on the leading edge as far as I'm concerned in a number of particular areas. When I look at deinstitutionalization and the work that the Association of Community Living did in that area, it's phenomenal. And if we were the first province in Canada to do this, with obviously great support from the federal and provincial government, but we took the initiative, we created it. We, I mean, I don't mean me, because I was not part of it, but we as a province did uh, tremendous work in that area. And, uh, you know, we're looked at by many other problems in terms of the progress that was being made here. We had people like um, Irene McGinn, the very first president of the Consumer Organization of Disabled People in Flannel Labrador, tremendous woman, sadly didn't uh, pass away once again earlier than we would have liked. Uh, Eric Norman, I've mentioned. I mean, I just uh, take my hat off to Eric for the tremendous work that he did, not only in terms of our problems, but he chaired the National uh, Umbrella Organization of People with Disabilities for many years. He was instrumental in the VA Rail decision, and the work that he did on that was just tremendous. I look at Dr. Norman and Greta Lush. They were instrumental in the creation of uh, not just wheelchair sports, but co-founding uh, members of the, the hub, Physically Disabled Service Center. They were just, they gave so much to the, the hub in terms of its growth and development. Uh, and uh, let me think, there's just Bill Murphy, uh, De Debbie Prim, I mean, Debbie Prim alone. I mean, that's, that's an individual that I think many people will recognize her name because she was a real icon in, in, in the city for sure, probably even the province. But uh, again, just uh, contributed immensely to the volunteer community and a lot of work within the hub, wheelchair sports, um, and just... Uh, just a genuine individual who cared. I remember her name. Yeah, I she Debbie. was. <laughs> Debbie worked at the, uh, just a funny story about Debbie when I think about her, because there's many. But one of the ones was we were, uh, we were going back to the accessibility legislation for a moment. We were really frustrated that it was not being implemented properly. And it was just falling down in so many places. So Penny Rowe, who was with the Community Services Council at the time, said to Joanne, we gotta go and make a complaint. I said, okay. 
Yes, she said, you have to go to the police station to make a complaint. I said, I have to go to the police station. Yes, she said, I was heading up the Accessibility Action C Committee at the time. She said, yeah. She said, you have to go there and make a complaint. I said, okay. Off I go to Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, where Debbie Friend worked. She was working. She was working there. So I go in and, uh, Debbie, yes. What are you doing, Joanne? Um, I'm here at the lodge to complain, Debbie. Oh, okay, well, let me get someone for you. She knew what I was up to because I had given her a heads up. So we just played this little game. So uh, I go in and um, she says, okay, well, you, you can ch chat with this fellow now. So I sat down and I explained what my problem was, that there was a piece of legislation that was not being enacted. And I thought they needed to be aware of it and more particular building that had violated the legislation completely and they needed to be investigated. Well, he said, okay, well, he said, now give me a few minutes and I'll get back to you. Then we knew what was happening. I mean, Debbie was just, uh, I'm, I'm sure, ready to bust a gut. She was like, looking at me and we look at each other and she say, you know what's happening now? They're in there scrambling, figuring out what to do with you. I said, okay. She said, there's probably many phone calls being made right now. I said, you're probably right. Anyway, finally, they came out and informed me that really there was nothing they could do because it wasn't under jur their jurisdiction to uh, implement that piece of legislation. Of course, we knew that going in, but what we were trying to do is make sure those phone calls were made to rattle somebody's cage. Yeah, but I mean, Debbie got a great laugh. Uh, uh, yeah, very clever, isn't it? Yes, yes Penny was, was pretty good at those kinds of things. So, But yeah, Debbie, Debbie contributed greatly. The other person I guess that stands out for me is, and I go way back with this one, was Dr. Henry uh, Stabb. Dr. Henry Stabb was a man who devoted uh, so much towards the uh, work around people who are experiencing mental illness and living with mental illness. I mean, he, uh, he fought bureaucracy. He was fighting at a time when Newfoundland wasn't even a province in our part of Canada. Uh, I mean, you're looking at the 1800s that he was involved, uh, early 1900s, uh, and he pushed so hard for proper care and treatment of individuals who are experiencing severe mental illness. So he, he certainly stands out for me. Uh, yeah, we've had uh, Marie Ryan, uh, just done tremendous work at a national level. Mary Reed, I mean, Mary is still thankfully involved with things today, but she was just did amazing work around the whole issue of independent living resource centers and so much more beyond that. Um, I think if you were to ask anybody, they will tell you Debbie Prem was involved with pretty well everything. Debbie. Yeah. With any disability organization, I, guess, I think you could see Debbie's uh, signature there with wheelchair sports to hug the ILRC. Uh, yeah, she was a pretty busy woman and uh, quite intriguing one. And another name, I'd say Gilbert Pike. Gilbert Pike, actually, he was a gentleman that worked within the provincial government, yeah. but uh, his partner was a woman with a disability and he, uh, he was very supportive of the disability community and very understanding. And I think as a, I believe the deputy minister did certainly what he could to support, uh, support people with disabilities. Eugene um, Pike would see and I be did amazing work around uh, issues that impacted individuals with low sight or people who were blind. Right. Yeah. Yes, that's another name mm -hmm. that I remember too. Yeah. Um, tell me how some of these changes came about. When I look back and I look at what might have created change in our history, uh, there's a number of things that stand out to me. I think one of the things that really created change is the 1981 Obstacles Report. And that is a federal document and it was done through a parliamentary committee uh, by David Smith. And it was, I think it's probably one of the most important documents within Canadian disability history. I'm speaking of that. I could be way off base, but that's how I believe. Um, it had approximately 130 recommendations that covered every aspect of life, from recreation to sport to employment, transportation, housing, sign language. I mean, it just covered so many aspects of an individual's life. 130 recommendations as to how things needed to be improved so people with disabilities could live successful and adequate lives. Um, so we was the cornerstone as far as I'm concerned of uh, where we needed to go as a country mm -hmm. to just make things easier for people to live their lives. Um, yeah, so, and the beauty about the report is that it talked to consumers. It talked to individuals with disabilities, what they were experiencing, what they were dealing with, with regard to attitudes, discrimination, employment. 
So that was fabulous to, to get that kind of input. So it laid the, the groundwork for other reports, other movement, and I know it triggered a lot of things when the federal government has new programs, new services, and yes, it, it did a lot of that. That was one thing that I really see as being significant in change. Within our province, when I look at employment, I think one of the things that really created change was the 1987 Task Force Report on Employment Equity. And it focused specifically on individuals with disabilities in the workforce and specifically why they were not in the provincial public service. I think at that point, it was less than 1% of people with disabilities employed within provincial government. That's a pretty sad uh, statistic yeah. that you, you, you don't want to have, actually. That report not didn't just look at a workforce analysis in terms of what's happening, but it looked at what needed to be done, not just in employment, but what about accessible, accessible transportation? How are people going to get to work? It looked at housing. It looked at human resources. It looked at a, a very broad scope. So it forced the government to look at themselves in terms of why they were not hiring and what needed to be done to create an opportunity for people with disabilities to be employed. So I, I saw that as being very significant. So yeah, that was, that was quite impressive. Um, I think legislation has created some change. As much as I may bemoan our Accessibility Act and regulations, I think it did. It did make some changes, no question. It does continue today. I guess I would just like to see it move a little bit faster. And um, what might be other things that uh, create a change? People. Mm. People create a change. Technology. Technology People created a change. Technology. And organizations. Organizations like the Canadian Mental Health Association, the Independent Living Resource Centre, the Association of the Deaf, Association of Community Living, organizations created change, but most important, people created change because it was people's stories, their lived experience that they were prepared to share and in many cases very courageous to share. You're looking at very strong stigma against people who are, have mental illness and for them to share stories. So, People create change, organizations for kids, absolutely. Yeah. In terms of when I think about leaders as well, I neglected to mention a couple, and I think I see them as being very important um, in terms of the work that he did. Walter Davis, uh, he just did tremendous work around rehabilitation, just absolutely tremendous in the 60s and early 70s. He worked within provincial government. He worked in a division called Rehabilitation Division. And he worked with a colleague by the name of Jerry Ruba, well-known advocate within the province, an author, started alongside club, very involved in the hearing association. They were two very instrumental people. And uh, Walter was a very, very intriguing man. Probably many will call him eccentric, but he had a vision. He cared deeply about the work that he did, and he cared deeply about individuals with disabilities and, and their right to live uh, adequately in the province. And prominent in the press. Weren't they? Pardon me? Prominent in the press, these people, these leaders. Yes, they were. Absolutely. They spoke out. Walter yes. advocated. I mean, he, he advocated within the provincial government. He advocated within the community. He, uh, he held that, that banner pretty, pretty high and uh, spoke out pretty loud. Was there an aha moment when you thought, oh, things are actually going to start changing now? Now or then? Then. Then. Um, I think the aha moment for me was when we created the Building Accessibility Act and regulations, because we did see that as being so significant, uh, because people were going to then be forced to create an environment that was going to be accessible for everyone. So that was like, yes, uh, but we, what we did is we sat back on our laurels. We didn't, we didn't force the legislation to work. We wanted it to work. Sure. And as Mary says, you know, you should have been out there monitoring and doing the work. So are you suggesting then that maybe there was a little bit of slipping back? Oh, the slipping back, yes. Uh, we've done, sadly, we've done too much slipping back as far as I'm concerned. I think one of the biggest mistakes that the provincial government ever made was the closing of the, the school for the deaf. I was just horrified to see that happening. And I think it was just terrible that they, they made that decision. Just terrible. Um, I think the, um, sadly, uh, incredible focus put on the deinstitutionalization um, 
certainly in terms of people with intellectual disabilities, but also when you look at the home care that enable people to live independently in a community, we're seeing a shift right now. We're seeing people who have great support living in the community, uh, living in their homes, like living in their apartments. Uh, and now maybe home care is a little bit more too expensive. So people are now moved, being forced to live in long-term care facilities. And I guess when you get to a certain age, you probably have an expectation that you're going to be living in a long-term care facility. But when you've incurred an injury at 35 or 40 years of age, you do not expect to be living in a long-term care facility with no outlet in terms of support moved beyond that. So sadly, we're seeing too much of that. We're seeing too many young people having to move into those facilities. So that's a shift from where we were in the late 70s, even early 80s. There was great movement in the community in terms of people living in community, pardon me, in community. We're slipping there, absolutely. I could ask you why you think this is happening. I mean, I think there's a. It's such a difficult question to answer in terms of why it may be happening. It's so loaded in terms of. There's so many variables with it. I think that there's sadly, I think there's more of a perception now that people need too much support to be living outside of institutions. Um, and yet, there is a drive and, a, and people talking about more home support and keeping people, all people, in their own homes as long as possible. Yes, there is, yes. Yeah. But I think it depends on the population you're talking about. If you have an individual who's incurred spinal cord injury and may need significant care to live in an independent living environment, um, Somebody may decide, well, that's just way too much money. That, uh, and we can't make that decision. Now, let's, we'll move you to a long-term care facility. Maybe at some point we'll look at uh, getting you moved out. Now, we know that moving out is really, nobody's working on it. And many people are not supporting it. So it's difficult money. I mean, it can be financial. It can be attitudes. It can be poor rehabilitation. It, uh, there's so many factors in that. So, Joanne, you've been uh, reflecting on your life up to now. Um, what leadership or community involvement has been, shall we say, most fulfilling for you? For you? Oh, um, I, I don't... As I look back in terms of my involvement with organizations, uh, I had tremendous uh, fun with all of them. And I, a lot of hard work, a lot of busy times, but I look at my involvement in wheelchair sports and hub. It was just fabulous. I love working with the Canadian Paraplegic Association. When I worked with the federal government, it took a little while to adjust, but I absolutely loved the work that I was doing. Uh, did lots of volunteer work over the years and loved every minute of it. Don't get me wrong, there were lots of times when people were, you know, disagreeing with you and arguing with you and you weren't getting things uh, moving forward like you would like. Um, but no, I have no regrets in terms of who I work with and the kind of work we did. You know, you always want progress to go a little bit faster than it is, but uh, no, it, uh, I look back at it all and smile and say, well, that was a blast. That is fabulous. Thank you. Is there, um, you talked about people in the past, I know this is about the history, but is there people that you have mentored that are coming up to carry the torch on? Wow, what a great question. I wonder if there are. Oh. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I just tell you this really quick story. I don't know if it's a matter of mentorship, but uh, I lived on Patrick Street um, when I was working at a place on Pennywell Road. And that's a bit of a distance, geography. I would wheel to and from work, up the hill. And in the process of doing that, I met this young boy, young, young whippersnapper. And anyway, he was really intrigued with my wheelchair. It's like, so why are you using a wheelchair and how does it work? And what do you do when you're doing certain things when you're not in a chair, you know, if you're, do you take your brace off and that kind of thing? Those kinds of things, those are questions that young boys have. So anyway, we, we went through all of those questions one by one. 
with some very good detail and others not so. But anyway, he got all these questions answered and um, met up with him next day, a couple more questions and the following day, you know what we're talking about? His school, his teachers. So we go back and forth. So I met, met him up a number of times, go back and forth to school and we chatted up and it's like, okay, it, it was just the curiosity of the disability. Once that was resolved in his head, it's like, okay, well, my teacher's doing this and I don't, I'm getting way too much homework and it was all about school and his classmates. So I don't know that that's so much is a mentorship, but I think when you're able to have that kind of an impact on somebody, you know, you, you don't need to go and do presentations anymore. You've just hopefully influenced a young person to see the wheelchair, but you see the person beyond that chair and you're prepared to share your stories with her. And that's inclusion at its best. It's fabulous. Yeah. I met him many years later. I, I had no idea. I was at the curling club and uh, sitting back chatting with somebody. And I had already told a story, you know, lots of times because it's so much fun to tell. And anyway, uh, he came up to me and his name was Paul. And he said, I remember he said, I was meeting many, many years ago when I was going to school. And he said, guess what I'm doing today? I'm a teacher. So you did have an impact. I don't know what was an impact, but it was it was fun. Yeah.